So this next sword I'm doing is a Dragon Slayer from the anime Berserk. There's some people that argue that as giant swords go, like ridiculously giant swords in anime and um, JRPGs and such like, that Berserk is the one of the first instances of a character with like a crazy big giant sword. The size of it is also a point of debate because he wears it on his back, which puts a limit on how big it can be compared to him. But then in other shots, especially in the um, the anime, I think the I think the manga was actually better about keeping it under control. In some shots, the sword looks like it's longer than him. You know, like there sometimes, and sometimes it's an artistic flourish, like a, perspe a forced perspective shot that just makes the sword look massive. In the anime, there's one little clip that always annoys me where he's like jumping with the sword to come down on a bunch of dudes. And it's clearly drawn so that it's like the sword is much bigger than he is. Like it's like one and a half times his length. And then he does his thing and then at the end of the fight he puts it back on his back. You know like it's, guys you can't have the character wear the sword on his back if it's taller than he is. It just doesn't work. I've made the Dragon Slayer before but I haven't done a build video for it. But that size... I think it was the, what the, the customer had worked out to be like the size he wanted and then other customers after that just kind of like wanted a repeat of the same like I mean the, it's you know because you can see it and you're like oh do you want it that length or bigger or smaller or whatever and uh, most of them just go for oh the big size the size you met it before so this is the size we worked out a million years ago uh, and of course there's some people on the internet who call it small you know the usual thing they all agree that it's too thin uh, my slabs are only ever a quarter inch thick because if it was thicker than that you wouldn't even be able to pose for a photograph um, the majority of them want to at least be able to pose with it in a photograph and even if this was half inch thick uh, that would that would be impossible you know and in the anime, it's like an inch thick. Huh. Cool, I only needed the one bottle. To account for evaporation, I'll just pad it out with some older stuff. It's been a couple of videos ago since I mentioned it, but this step is to take the all the scale off the base plate. Yeah. Well, the middle scale is a super thin layer of this mostly carbon stuff. I heard someone in the comments say it was like a hematite type thing but for whatever reason it's um, very hard on the abrasives. You know, it's just got a different quality that it takes a while to hack through and uh, seeing as this is hard ox the orange stuff on top is also this kind of epoxy stuff but the vinegar seems to deal with that too. Normally I'd set up the thing inside with the bottle jack to take out the warp, but this one has such a slight warp. I'm just going to give it a go in this guy. <sighs> my grip this thing will hit me in the face <laughs> I don't know man I think I'm setting up the bottle jack damn it 
three marked points. Um, 10 millimeters of deflection at each point. I mean, the, this warp I'm trying to take out is really small. But you know, that's the problem when you're trying to take out a very small imperfection. Just to not go too far and ruin everything. It's still there. More than 10 millimeters of deflection at each point. It would appear. I'll try 20, I guess. Mm. Back in the day when I worked for a big, huge industrial welding place, I used to use their rotors for doing stuff like this. You know, like big, massive things. Probably, you know, the length of the entire shop. I mean, you wouldn't get it in here. But I'm trying to think what it physically, it would probably physically fit in here. But, um, you know, I used to roll the blank the opposite way. You know, it was for a curving plate steel. Roll the blank the opposite direction and then check was it flat and then walk around the machine and then roll, put it through again in little tiny increments. And just to think though that I used to moan and complain that that took ages. Moving here and setting up my own little tiny workshop. There's lots of pretty adjustments I had to make when I stopped working semi parasitically. I do miss the big giant rollers. This is sliding now because the base, the half inch base plate is, uh, base plate is also bowing. Nearly there. I'm trying to get it up to 230, which would be. 30 mil of a deflection. You know, I did. I did 10 mil of a deflection. That did nothing. I did 20 mil of a deflection. That did nothing. I did 25 because I was getting nervous. That did nothing. And now we're trying 30 mil of deflection. When I say that did nothing, I mean when I relax the um, bottle jack. It was still, still had that very slight curve in it. And because it's so slight, I'm nervous about overdoing it, you know? Oh man, it's so close. So close. I might give it another blast. Do it up to... One more, one more try. So this sword is so old that I, or not old, rather, uh, I started making this one before I really knew what I was doing. So instead of making life-size templates, I actually had a list of measurements. This is a text file somewhere on my computer. 180. 130, 130 back, down to the center. Is that right? The gap is 16 millimeters. Oh wow, I didn't know that. I thought it was 12. And this is for the um, roundy bit at the end. But what I'm doing now is the tip. And according to this thing, it's um, 130 back. Shloop. And then up to the center. Clunk. It's fairly snub-nosed, if memory serves. Whoa! Important historical document nearly blew away. The edge of this plate, where it was cut, is a little... You can see there's a little divot, which meant measuring was this... in the exact center, a little bit hard. So, um, sometimes when I have to deal with that, like the edges of plates being off, um, so a straight line across, and these two things are both exactly 61 mil, you know, without being planned, you know, I could have drawn anywhere, and just see, like, were the two line sections the same length, and they were. The corners on plates often get weird if you're trying to get a measure from them. Now I want to use the offcuts from the sword to do an experiment. 
I could have used any old piece of hard ox that um, I had previously stripped, you know, some other off cut. But just to ensure the maximum similarity, it's best if I use these. This is a hydrogen uh, peroxide vinegar mix, 8 to 1, although I, I've seen all sorts of different um, numbers and figures on the internet. Um, a mostly hydrogen peroxide mix with some vinegar in it. So now, experiment. This part is the part that I sprayed with the stuff. This was the part that had the tape over. And now I'm going to... Oh, it's not going to fit in the pot! Hmm, I need a bigger pot. Damn it! Okay. Attempt two. Hmm. This is the real test now. Like the majority of that comes off. So this is the results of the experiment. The one on the right was the boiled one, the one that was rusted and then boiled. And that happened on the same day. The one on the left, I left out over the weekend and then didn't boil it. I just used the steel wire brush. And while they both kind of worked, I mean, they both worked, but I do think this one, because of the way the uh, Dragon Slayer is drawn, I think the mottled look will be better than this smoother look. And this is less dark, weirdly enough. Like this is more just like um, grade. So I think this is the one I'm going to go for. I'm going to figure out how to boil, or not figure out, I know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to have to set up a thing to boil a giant sword. There's no point over wetting it either, I find. Yeah, I should have been wearing my respirator. That's real stinging in my nose. Um, yeah, there's no point over wetting it. I'll let it do its thing, then wipe it down and squirt it again, come back to it. Over the oh, you can see it's kind of starting to work. But I find if you squirt too much, it forms great big flakes that come off instantly. The trick is to uh, let it do its thing slowly, slowly build up the rust. Back when I worked in the um, big, bigger place, I had a machinist friend actually cut these out of a, you know, a solid pair of discs. You know, a half inch plate, and then they do the furrow. This is like a trench, you know, they, they carve it out for me. Moving here though, I do it now in, in separate plates. This whole shape will be a, a quarter inch base plate, and then this shape here, and then this shape going around will be other quarter inch plates. This one will be welded around from the outside, and this one will be plug welds on the surface. While it's more work, um, it's debatable which method was actually better because using this method, I get a firmer join. Come on, come on. Sorry, I'm talking slowly because I'm concentrating. There we go. Because this is now a separate plate, it's not part of a big giant plate. Before I use the plug welds to join this onto the surface, I have all of this underside cut out. You know, there's another, like I don't have it drawn here because it doesn't matter, but there's another semicircle cut out of this, this qu quarter inch base plate. And that's how this thing gets welded onto the sword. And like, and then when the handle comes out of here, well, it's a lot of, it would take a tremendous amount of force to separate all those things.
So these are the parts for the um, blade collar, I guess you'd call it, um, after the vinegar and such. Um, you can see the blue around the edge that I marked as the excess messy furry edge that has to come off. I could have gotten these a little bit closer, but I was so worried about um, not getting it right because, especially on this inner ring, um, if I didn't get if I didn't get it right, like if there was an incut and like and I had to like shave off more to get rid of like a divot in, um, because these two lines are so close together, that would be more obvious than it would be on like a, a big organic shape. Like if there was a you know a big long curve, I could I can you know there's there's far more to work with you know. So now that I've done the guts of the job with the angle grinder, I have this set up in the with the die grinder in the in the crock lock. This is 90 degrees. This So I ground around the edge, welded, welded these guys together and now I've tacked the two plates together so that as I grind them, even if there's some minor uh, difference, you know, like some minor deviation from the actual template, at least they'll be the same as each other. Just the two surfaces joined together, two pieces, to crack it apart now. Oh, I don't like that piece of spatter that snuck in there. Curse my excellent welding skills! I can see the crack all the way around. But I don't want to mess with this because then it won't be flush to the surface of the sword. Oh wait, it's coming! Yay! You know, people often wonder about the strengths of welds, but there was basically nothing holding those two guys together. I also had some other ones for the plug welds. They don't have to be as precise, seeing as they're, you know, plug welds.
<clears throat> Here's the thing, I was full sure I had recorded a bit of video of me standing in front of the um, now rusty blade of the Dragon Slayer talking about, oh, look at that, oh, nice red, even covering, it came out just fine, that should be good to boil now. But for the life of me, I couldn't find it anywhere. I'm inclined to believe I was very tired and didn't actually hit record. Yon trough is just a barrel I cut in two, filled with regular water and probably sludge. Sometimes when I'm doing videos and stuff, I'll fill it with oil and light it up if I want a fire in the background or something. The important thing if you're doing this by yourself is to make sure the trough is reasonably level before you start doing your thing. The more level it is, the less water you'll have to use. And the less water you have to use, the shorter amount of time you'll have to spend heating it up. Now the trick is to dry it off before it gets regular rusty again. Because it was so hot, yeah. um, coming out of the water, it actually was easy to dry. I was worried about being able to dry it quick enough because it was raining earlier and stuff. It's fine. The only weird thing that happened is the edge uh, got a little bit rusty mottled uh, from its dunk in there but I wanted to polish this up anyway so it won't be that's not I mean it's only that much to polish so this isn't this is way doable but the actual middle part the part I was worried about the black I'm fairly impressed with how it came out like I'm, I wonder how it will hold up to abuse but seems even sturdier than the um, sample pieces I did. Now, just in case something goes wrong. That's what I was worrying about. A lot of it's not actually joined to the surface. A lot of it's just dirt, kind of like dirt that's sitting there. It'll be slightly lighter colored when I'm done. It'll be more honest after doing this. See, that's still there, but it's lighter, more stone colored than black. Ah, that is more like the samples. Still, once I shine up the edge, it will increase the contrast. Might be going, why doesn't he just leave it the darker color? It's like, well, because this sword is going to be smashed through stuff. I don't want to leave anyone with a false impression of how sturdy this is. I only want to, I only want to have the stuff that's actually fused. So I wonder, does that mean I could make a crisis core buster sword out of the this stuff? The hard ox. The color of the mill scale from the mild steel was like an exact perfect match for the um, Crisis Core Buster Sword. But I wonder would this grey do just as well? So for the pommel, I actually did find a lump big enough. Normally I have to uh, weld different parts together and stuff, but prefer obviously when I can just carve it out of one big lump not because it, it's stronger but because it's way less work the pommel is another thing that varies a lot from uh, version to version but I think most of them are longer as opposed to wider I've seen some of them that are very squat and wide but um, you know I think there's more of them that are portrayed this kind of long shape. I'll start with this surface, these two surfaces, this other one here because it's crazy off cut isn't level at all. Grind, grind, grind. I'm using the Franken grinder to get the last part because it has a narrower uh, this, a, this a diameter is the narrower like the, the head of the tool and stuff so the disc can get down deeper it 
as the shape gets weirder, it gets harder to uh, grip. I might well, yeah, I'm gonna weld something on here real quick just so I can grab it. Now I have to cut the other direction. I was just using the sander to even up the lines and stuff. They're not perfect, but they're perfect enough that I'll be able to cut the cut the other side, you know, cut this in this dimension. I have to bevel the edges, but that's the basic shape. So that's the pommel beside the remains of the block I cut it out of. They got left outside overnight, so that's why they're all rusty. That was a clean cut yesterday. Let's get a kick scene out of what you can make out of old crap. Flat as a pancake. Cool. Yeah, bit by bit it all comes together. I thought this leather coat would be enough, but um, it started to burn through the sleeve, so I have to get this guy out. This coat is thicker, so I'm just worried about my circulation while I'm doing this. Because this thing, uh, it slips on with elastic. It seems to be okay. I swear, you know, when I get into the, the grinding, um, I turn off most of the signals coming off the owl body. So if my arm does start to go dead, I won't know it till the grinder starts to behave funny. Yeah. Sparks. Solid lumps of sparks. So now that the um, edge is more or less sharpened, I mean it is sharp, but it's 
the surface is rough it hasn't been sandpapered yet it's just been ground that's enough for me to mark uh, where this hole has to go because uh, I have to plasma cut because the hard ox is too hard to drill um, or too hard for me to drill with what I have here I'm going to plasma cut this hole obviously there's lots of very careful making sure this was in the right place kind of thing going on I'm going to tack it in this position and then clamp it down properly to do the full weld. I really like having the um, plasma cutter for doing all of these odd shaped guards, you know? Like it would be a pain in the ass to make these with the angle grinder. Now I'll move it to the big table and do the full weld. The reason I didn't do um, these tacks on the full table is once it's clamped flat, I wasn't able to slide the ruler square down the side and get a measure. But now that it's tacked and not moving, I don't need to do that anymore. So now I'm about to attach the second side after doing the full weld on this side. I can't clamp this flat now because of this guy. So instead I put a half inch spacer way up there. That is not feeding properly. Couldn't find what was actually wrong with it, but you get that sometimes, just random kink in the wire, welder starts to act contrary. All these bits along here were to stop bits of spatter. Um, you know, the I touch these so there's a plate here keeping this part spatter free there we go whoa hot and then yo and then those random bits were just to stop bits of spatter shooting under this edge because if something hot lodged to uh, that inner rim I die grounded out um, if it was a, if it was only a tiny little join, like I could probably crack it off. But if something nasty gone under there, it would make my life difficult. Fifteen point five sixteen. You know, most times I don't mind that I don't have a TIG welder, I make do, yow. But on this occasion, um, you know, I'm gonna fill, grind in, and then fill this up with weld, and then grind back again. 
and just th this one section would be uh, way easier if I had a TIG welder. Like I actually uh, um, like the heavy build that you get with the MIG welder for all of this stuff. Um, but yeah, just this this thing is a this little groove here is annoying. So that's all those joints ground back. You know the weld goes around and, and here and all that stuff. These bevels aren't as pronounced on the real one, but I found the um, they absolutely kills your hands when you're using it. If these are sharp corners, um, so I like to put a nice bevel on them. Just the weight of this thing when you're trying to use it. There's no point leaving big, huge gouge bits of flesh on your wrist. Like, oh, there's one. There's an old one. So, another thing I wanted to try on previous Dragon Slayers, but couldn't for whatever reason, is the Dragon Slayer has a tapered handle. Like, it looks tapered in all the de depictions, but because it starts off at inch quarter and goes down to a bit smaller, I never really had the setup to do it. And to tell the truth, I still don't have the setup to do it, but I put this thing together. I'm going to take the grinder and uh, eat into this, but it's very late now, so I might wait till tomorrow to do it uh, when my reflexes are a bit faster, and if I get mangled, uh, I might be able to summon someone to take me to hospital kind of thing. So, that's that done. It's relatively subtle, but like, uh, it wasn't that much work to do. You can see that's the original diameter up there at the top, and that's how much I brought it in. And then, god damn it, because, because it does a uh, gradual coming out to the original diameter again at the bottom, it's almost imperceptible, but, uh, eh, it's debatable whether anyone will notice I did that or not. God damn it. So one of the things I was worried about doing this is now that it's tapered, centering the um, handle and making sure it's lined up properly with the blade. So this bit, uh, buddy bit at the end is still the original diameter and this bit here at the end where I'm going to chop it off is the original diameter. So I'm going to insert this um, thing, I just, I just found a piece of 8 inch, shoved it under and then slid it along till it was making contact with the bar. And these two are clamped down, so you tack here and all of a sudden this thing now keeps it at that original, floating at that original height. So tack it here, uh, cut it off there, cut off this nubby bit so I can attach the pommel. But this thing here, welded on, will still ensure that when I put it on the table, you know, it's rested on that wide piece here and rested on the original diameter here and the sword's up here, that it's still, in theory, lined up with the sword properly. I hope. I also have to drill two holes. Having this bit here will make drilling those holes easier. I like to use rivets to hold the uh, bandages onto the handle. It's kind of raggy things. 3 16 This little piece of plastic here is um, invaluable. Whatever it is, 30 cents worth of plastic. There we go. But I get unduly distressed when it goes missing. So, measure across, measure across, get the center lines of this guy. Took a paper tracing of this guy and then folded it over to get the centers of this. It's not because of the nature of the poverty uh, lathe I constructed. It's not perfectly um, round, it's more ovo oval, ovoid. So then, but fold it over at the center of that so then I can take it and put it on the center lines I drew here and get where I'm supposed to mount the handle which does look more tapered now that it's I've only cut out the section I'm actually using. And that gets mounted there and careful to be a lot of fiddling to make sure that it's actually in the middle. That hole is for the, the rivet. I wish I had a more sophisticated way of clamping this but I guess this will have to do. Uh, because you know it's one odd shape with no 90 degree angles and another odd shape with no 90 degree angles. There wasn't a lot I could do except eyeball it up and down. Might have to adjust it once I'm actually done welding it. Oh. 
I had to cut this guy down because it was getting in the way of the, the grinder getting in there. Now, it wasn't lined up yet, but I wanted to get that first attack in. This guy needs to come over here, but when I had this clamp here, because of the nature of it, it was sliding on me, so tacked here, I can now move the back of the handle into position while keeping this one in the place where it needs to be. The blade is locked down flat so it can't move. So I unclamp this guy. I drag this guy. Ha! Huh. Curse my good weatherly! Usually when you just have one tack, it's nice and polite and moves for you. For whatever reason, this one isn't. Maybe I should clamp it tight and then tap it. Well, let's see what happens when I turn the lights off. Can you actually see what I was trying to line it up with? The laser is suspended from the roof and pointing more or less directly down, lined up with the tip. I'm moving around in more or less pitch darkness now. Turn around the viewfinder. Oh, you can see the line, but you can't see any of the sword at all. Don't think I got a shot of the bevel uh, beforehand, but like, the, you know, the top of this guy was beveled. I was worried about flooding the, the hole with weld because the bevel came more or less right to the edge of the hole. But it seems to have survived. Like I might have to clean it out a little bit, but it's not like completely gone. Um, yeah, so that's the first. That's the first side done. Flip it over, and I do the same. This is the flip. Whoa, that was weird. Or is there anything spooky around? Anyway, this is the flipped over side. That is the um, bevel. You can see that that is the area that gets filled up with weld, and in there. This is why when I was welding the um, semicircular guard, hilt, whatever you want to call it, it's neither collar, um, I left this area exposed, I didn't finish off the weld because I wanted to be positive that when I do this now I'm able to get a solid join between this and the actual plate underneath here, the blade, you know. It's hard underneath the artificial light, everything looks more glary, especially on the camera there. But um, that's the basic shape, you know, all the excess ground away, so that it's comfortable on the hand. And uh, there's a slight swoop up into the uh, the collar, which uh, the um, actual one from the anime more shoots straight in, um, or at least that's what it looks like. But the, the collar on the anime one is much wider, so I think that's more obvious. And also, once I wrap this in bandages, that like little... You know, like, if it was, if looks weren't an issue at all, you'd leave all of the weld for maximum strength. So I'm going to leave that, I'm going to leave that swoop, not have it be like a dead, you know, a, a false, you know, like, I, I could, if it looked like two separate pieces, if, it, if I wanted it to look like two separate pieces, like I do when I'm doing the buster sword, I'd grind this more, grind it, grind it round, get some paper out and stuff. This will be, since this gets wrapped in bandages, you might as well leave it as strong as possible. I have to cut this notch out of the level. This is one of many and it doesn't actually affect its use as a... I mean, the, all the spirits are gone in it anyway, I just use it as a straight edge. But this way I can polish the edge without damaging the hematite.
the hole through the collar on the sword has this chain link thing hanging off it. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to make the pin first. So I find the dome nuts that you can buy, they ride a little high, like they're very lumpy and if you uh, look at the thing, it, it, you know, it usually looks like a nice neat stud, which I guess was supposed to imitate a rivet or whatever. But I like something you can actually screw on. So I usually, because the dome nuts are, like I said, they're very high, I usually custom make a thing, you know, just with a screw and a, um, weld a screw on top and then make a very flat small cap. Side there. Ah, I don't like that. Hmm. That's why I like the wire wheel as well. Oftentimes, if there's a little uh, weakness in the weld, it'll bring it to the surface better. Thing pushed out for whatever reason, the hammer blows. Damn it, I'll have to squeeze it in. There, that's that thing finished. I hope that's the three quarter inch. No, not three quarter inch, one and a quarter inch. Uh, if it's not, I have to shave down the head. Oh. So this is after I smoothed off the edge. I left that as the very last step. Um, just on the off chance that, you know, anything happened, like the sword fell over into another piece of hard ox, or when I was welding down here, a piece of splatter went sloop, bloop, to put this final smoothing onto the, um, the edge of the edge, I guess you'd call it. I see I haven't done it to this other side yet. You can see it's rougher. Um, I left it to the very finish just to protect against that. So I always get nervous about this part of the job because um, it doesn't matter too much on the Berserk Sword because it kind of suits it to be um, dirty and stuff uh, because of the nature of the fiction. You know, it wouldn't look out of place to have a rough and tumble damaged, you know, like the, it's supposed to look like bandages. A lot of the anime swords, you know, no matter what the person's up to, you know, their, their costume is always perfect and their hair is always perfect and all that sort of crap. But Berserk kind of lends itself to being a bit rougher looking. So if my filthy hands manage to transfer some filth onto these bandages, it won't be the end of the world. The aesthetic will still be correct. Come on, there we go. 
I actually had these bandages left over from doing something else. But the way you make them is it's just a strip of cloth, usually a bed sheet. And then I um, cut a, rip a two inch strip and then it's, it's easy to sew them yourselves but I normally out of laziness get my wife to do it to sew up um, a tube you know along the ragged edge and then turn it inside out so the ragged edge is on the inside and then you get this um, you get this bandage that has flat edges you know because if I just if you just rip a piece that doesn't work also I don't know can you see I've covered the um, handle in duct tape because it's a cloth bandage there's always the ch well, there's the well not the chance the certainty of people sweating through it and while I wouldn't be damn worried about rust damaging the structural integrity of the of the handle or whatever because it's so thick that wouldn't be an issue what I would worry about although that might look cool too is the rust then seeping back through and then your uh, off white rags would then start to look kind of red actually that would be probably cool anyway I put, I put tape on to stop that turning the tube inside out is kind of fun when you've made the you know so sewed up the um, tube you stick a big long thing usually I stick some sort of bar but any kind of you could do it with a stiff wire too and then um, lock it in a vise because a lot of a lot of what you don't realize is you know like these kind of swords that are wrapped around and around you need an extraordinary length of stuff to do that even with a, a moderately sized handle and the big long handles on my swords you need a, a huge big long thing I'm going to use the needle from my splinter kit There it is. Mm, I don't like that's left on that took so much force to get into there's some sharp edges left. Actually this is aluminum. I don't need to think of file it down. This is just that regular contact cement stuff. The type the, the glue sniffers use. There's probably better cloth glues and stuff. I found this one works pretty good. This is wrapped in cling wrap to keep it clean, which I often find is the hardest challenge around these here parts. This is the, um, you can see the nut has been rounded off except on two of its sides. This delicate process of, I'm gonna squeeze the thing on the other side. Uh, tighten it without upsetting the alignment of the uh, part on the top. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. There we go.
impressed with, because I've, I've made this sword before, is how well the hematite stuff, um, the, the black part in the middle held up. I was dreading, you know, that I'd slice it through those big wood blocks and there'd be a big shiny streak where it got rubbed off the surface. But it really, I can't detect at all. Like I can see it more on the edge. There's one or two tiny scratches I'm gonna have to um, sandpaper out where it went too far and maybe scraped off a nail in that big block or something. But the main body of it, the actual hematite, doesn't seem to have suffered any damage, which is great. It means I'll be able to do this on future projects. You know, if you've watched the video all the way to the end, and you're still watching it, probably means you enjoyed what you saw, you might consider heading over to the Owl Patreon, throwing us a dollar or two. These uh, videos are extraordinarily hard to make, like poor old Anthony here behind the camera, he's, he's a human, he has to food once a day, once a day? At least twice. At least twice a day, when right? I can. And like, you know, and I have to, I mean, it's shocking the horrible mistreatment I give Anthony, you know? But uh, yeah, so if you want Anthony to eat food, head over to Patreon.